Hello, I'm Mauricio. I'm a lecturer and uh, bass instructor here at the RMCM Access to Music uh, Popular Music course. I'm here with my student uh, Jamie and we're doing some exercises um, related to improvisation on the electric bass. But I guess improvisation on any instrument really. Uh, with this exercise we're uh, talking about tackling guide tones uh, specifically. Uh, guide tones are normally, uh, we, 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 we talk about guide tones as, uh, normally they refer to the third and the seventh of the chord. And what's special about them is that they're the ones that define the quality of the chord and they define the way that we're going to lead our voices in the weave that we create harmonically. Uh, as bass players, through, the, through genres, we're really accustomed to just think of the root and sort of hang every other concept from the root. This exercise tries to perhaps expand that concept a, li concept a little bit and give some reach to the thirds and the sevens as separate entities rather than just secondary things that conceptually we, we hang from the shape that we have uh, of the chord. Um, what we've done with this exercise is we, we've completely deconstructed every single step and complication that this task might have. For example, we enter a chord through this, the third and we exit the chord through its seventh. So that, for example, in, in a cycle of fourths based harmony, that seventh would resolve down to the third of the next chord. And you know, this would be reproduced a chord, you know, in a chain of two five ones, it would work, it would be golden. Um, however, there's, there's many things that can happen when we go from that third to that seventh. We can go, and this is simple, but hey, put it on the bass, go from the third to the seventh upwards, or from the third to the seventh downwards. That has different implications that we have to practice, I believe, separately. And that it's easier to practice separately. You, basically save time by spending time at the beginning. So let's think about entering each of these chords through its third mm. and exiting the chord, and by this I mean simply playing a note towards the end of the period of that chord, whether it's a bar or half a bar, that is the seventh. Let's think about the implications of that. If a chord has a major third, if it, in a major seventh chord, yeah. for example, let's say G. Yeah. If we see the third of G, Upwards. You say we're going upwards? Let's go upwards. How far upwards do we have to go to reach the major seventh? A fifth. A fifth. Perfect. In a minor seventh chord? How far upwards do we go from the third? Also a fifth. Also a fifth. That is kind of a, a simple thing, but it's an important realization. For example, in a chord like, and we talked about this in the past, in a chord like F major seven. If I think of the third right here, I normally don't place this note as its seventh. I think of that note as its seventh when I'm somewhere else. But here, I would think of the seventh right there, which is also a fifth. But this kind of movement right there, which is you know, it's just a fifth after all, kind of gets rid of the blind spot that I think we all have around this area, and then again around this area, where the positions link or merge. Um, dominant chord. Yeah, G. Seven. Third. A triatom. And that's all we've got. So basically all we need to do is look at the chord. If it's major, go to its third, go a fifth up to its seventh. Mm -hmm. If it's minor, find its third, which we know we can do. Up a fifth, find its seventh. If it's dominant, triatom. Yeah. It turns out that that is the solution. When we try to do it by thinking of the chord, it gets complicated very quickly and we have to practice it thinking many things that are not really relevant to the task at hand. So let's just think of the third and tackle the seventh and let it resolve to the third of the next chord. Mm. Let's give it a try. We're using uh, Charlie Parker's Ornithology for this. For this kind of exercise, really any Charlie Parker or bebop song is, is ideal because it's filled with uh, cycle of fours, harmony, and two five one, six two five ones, and all that kind of stuff.
it's when we're finding the chords that change two per bar. Mm. So what we do is we find a pattern in that. Since, we, since it is a 2-5, we're looking yeah. here at an A half diminished and a D7 flat 9. We know that there's a pattern there, and that's a pattern that's going to mm -hmm. be reproduced across the whole song, every 2-5 that we find. So yeah. what's the pattern? So it would be... That's it. And yeah. it's going to be the same one for the major 2-5-1 in the A minor D7. And then when we find the B minor E7, it's the same thing, a step up. So how does that look? Uh. That's it. And uh, the song is uh, solved, basically. Yeah. Because the rest of the time we have time. Shall we give it another try? Give it another try, yeah. Alright. There's nothing else, that's all there is, yeah. at least in terms of thirds and sevenths. Then we do starting from the seventh, going up to the third. Mm. Starting from the seventh, going down to the third. And it seems exhaustive, but when we solve the problems little by little in this way, suddenly we face the progression and we can really freely play around kind of effortlessly. Mm. I guess because we've put the effort before. Very important to move this around keys as well. At some point we're starting to learn this song and learn the keys. And that's useful in a way, but it's also going against the grain of the exercise. So as quickly, as, as soon as you start getting too familiar, shift the key. Keep the exercise fresh. And that's the exercise.